Yeah, so uh, the last few weeks, um, several of you have been submitting some questions. And uh, so we're going to go through some of those questions that came up today. And like I said, um, our hope is to do this once a quarter. This will be our, th our third time we've done it. And it's uh, usually been pretty fun. And it feels like uh, Caleb and Heiko are up to something. What, what kind of mischief are you guys concocting back there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm nervous. Okay. <laughs> yeah, save it for Tuesday. Um, submissions have already been accepted. No more submissions are being accepted. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and get to the very first question, and I know that it has to do with uh, Christian and Janice. So go ahead and put up the first. And actually, there was a there was a couple that came through, and um, so this is for you two. All right, so it says somebody wrote, and I think this was anonymous. We're so excited to have you at Belay. Can you tell us a little more about yourselves and your story up to this point? What do you believe God is calling each of you to do in Boulder? What is your ministry? Why Boulder? So there's like four related questions <laughs> in there. <laughs> All right. Why don't you get started? Good morning. Oh, I better hold on. I'll hold on. Do I just hold it? I don't yeah, have yeah, to. Just okay. Hold it. Okay. Good morning. Um, we're so excited to be here too. So why Boulder? <laughs> why Boulder? It's because God told us to come. And there's been times that when God has told us to do stuff and we've said no, and we've learned over the course of time to say yes, and to say yes quickly, generally. So um, we said yes, and so that's why we're here um, in Boulder. And then... Can you t tell us even, if I can interject, how yes. did he put that on your heart? How did that, how did, how did, y how did you know? So we were here in May of 2022, and we have been um, partnering with Belay and with the Durban since 2020. We had made some, some um, trips to do prayer walking together and to just help support, you know, because um, it can be lonely. So we were here in May 2022, and while we were here, I, I didn't tell anyone this was just between me and God, but God, the Holy Spirit kind of whispered, you're going to be moving there. And... It, you know, it's one of those flitting thoughts, and I went, oh, okay, that's nice, and I just knew that I was just, it was, I was just going to keep it, you know, how Mary <coughs> treasured things in her heart. I kind of just did that, knowing that the right timing would come, and so then um, I just prayed into it, prayed into it, prayed into it, and then November comes, I have a dream, a significant dream, and then after that, there was this compulsion to start to to speak it and to bring other people into it. So then I went to Christian and I said, I think God wants us to move to Colorado, to Boulder, to Belay specifically. And so then we brought our son and, and our daughter-in-law into it and we prayed as a family for about six weeks. And then on Martin Luther King Jr. Day this year, we made the decision, called the Durbans and said, I think we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually we, we told them in December um, too. We brought our family into it, Micah and Elmira, and then we called them and said, we think. And so we had been praying for about six weeks, probably. Yeah. And, and, and just, and it's, and they also were like, what do you think? You know, they did ask us, what do you guys think? Is that, mm -hmm. does that resonate with you too? Mm -hmm. yes. So yeah, they gave us kind of that opportunity to, to for pray sure. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Please say no. yeah, it's about partnership and teamwork. Definitely. And we need to, you know, we, we yield to authority and, and it's very, we honor authority and being in the right timing, you know, if, if, you know, we just want to check, check with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was great. Yeah. You can answer that. Oh, I think you did pretty <laughs> good. Uh, what, yeah. About so yourselves at this point. Yeah. yeah up, your, so yeah up, up to, up to Boulder. What's, what's been going yeah, on? Yeah. So previously, um, I was the senior pastor at the church that we were at for about 10 years. And one of the hallmarks I would say of Janice and I of ministry is that um, God oftentimes uses us uh, historically just in building families, building relationships, uh, broken relationships, uh, and just the idea of identity within that. Um, so the church that we were at originally before we came here was a very hurt church. Uh, it was a very wounded church. And coming here to Belay, now Belay is not a hurt church. It's a growing church. It's a new church plant but we're dealing with lots of hurt families. We're all broken. Yep. Um, Boulder has lots of brokenness over it. Even though it's a beautiful location, there's lots of broken uh, people. 
Uh, we live in a fallen, broken world. That's the reality in which we live, um, even in the midst of the beauty. And so with what we're doing here, it's really partly discovery as well. You know, Janice and I are just open to what God would have. Um, I am presently working at um, a company called, well, I won't say the company's name right now, but it's a mental health uh, facility that's going to be opening up here in Boulder. Um, but it's delayed, and so I travel down to uh, Colorado Springs uh, once a week, uh, sometimes twice a week, or Denver, which is, that's a long drive. Um, and so, so we're getting connected within the community. And so, but within that, what do we believe God is calling each of you to do specifically in Boulder? Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer other than to engage um, and to preach the gospel, to minister, and we minister a little bit differently, I would suppose. I mean, we all have that kind of a unique flavor of ministry, mm -hmm. and so we all come together and we support each other, and we kind of really just, it's like a puzzle piece. God brings us together so that we work as one, and so we're in that discovery, but I don't know if you have anything specific that you want to answer to that. How about what is your daytime? What is your job, Janice? Uh, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, right now, I'm seeing clients online exclusively, um, looking to um, the group private practice that I'm partnered with in, in Colorado um, is looking to open an um, in-person office uh, in Boulder um, by the end of the year. Whether or not that comes to pass, we'll see. Um, but I am licensed in California and Colorado um, yeah, so I work at home. He's working at home. We're, um, we're having dogs. fun. We are, mm -hmm. with the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a definitely a new season. Um, I'll answer a little bit more to what God is calling you to. to with I know there's another question that I'm going to tie that to. So. Sure. Oh, yeah. I just want to say that um, they, they did do this as a step of faith. You know, they didn't have these jobs beforehand. You know, they didn't have a place to live here. They said, yes, Lord, and then the Lord has opened up the doors. So that's often what happens. Like, we don't know the next step along the way. It's just that they said, yes, Lord. And so along the way, we've all been praying, and they'll, they've will they been updating us of, guess what? I got a job. Guess what? We got an apartment. It's been pretty exciting along the way. Yeah, and I think you know, too, but just it bears worth re it's worth repeating as well that, you know, Belay has no staff right now. I'm, I'm not on staff by Belay. Um, I have mission support that has me here. And uh, there was no job openings, you know, for <laughs> us to hire Christian or anything like that. And so I just respect for them that uh, he's, he's gone from being in a church ministry that provided for them to coming here on faith and finding a job. And he's, I know they're both working very, very hard, you know, a lot, a lot of hours right now. So um, we appreciate just the steps of faith you guys have taken. Awesome. Was there anything more? Did we miss anything on that screen that we're aware of? No? Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so I don't remember the order. I think there's yeah, like, like 14 questions all together. We'll maybe do six or seven today. But it says, at what point does a career, and anybody can answer this one, all right? At what point does a career, a hobby, or other personal interest become an idol? Is it selfish to spend time and or money on such interests that don't have a clear connection to God's kingdom? Anybody want to take that? I love this question. I think this question is saying this person sees the world or, you know, the, wor the church has even taught the world that, taught us that there's the world and then there's God's part, right? But who's the creator of all of it? God is the creator of all of it. And I believe that he sees all of your life as sacred. If we're walking with him, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, every part of our life is sacred. And I love the example of Joseph, who even though he was put into slavery, even though he was put in prison, even though he was even, um, he was put into high places of authority and influence, every part of that, of his life was sacred. It was all sacred. So I think that, um, that the Lord gives us interests and hobbies, and those can be used by him. You know, I love Jesus' high priestly prayer. I've been really meditating on it a lot lately in the book of John. And in the book of John, he says, Lord, I, I don't pray that you'll take these people out of the world. I pray that you'll keep them from the evil one. God is not wanting to take us out of the world and take away all of your interests and your abilities and your talents. That's not the goal, to just keep you in a little church building where all you do is sing all day long, you know. He's actually wanted to keep you in the world. He's given you 
interests and talents and abilities. And he's given those things to you because he wants you to be an influence into this world. He wants you to use those things. We all have a mission. Each one of you is a missionary in a way. You have a mission to be his ambassador into the world. And he uses your talents. He uses your giftings. He uses your abilities. I even think about the way Jesus taught his people. Jesus' stories are full of everyday things. He, he uses stories from farmers. He uses stories um, even from um, military leaders. He uses the, um, the stories of the fishermen. And all of these are interests and abilities. Some of these things are hobbies. And he uses them all. To, t to speak to people, and I think that alone says that those things were important and that they can be sacred. Now, when, is the, when does it become like a, something that you're lifting up over God? That's something that you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about. Are you spending that time alone with him? Are you putting the most important things first? Are you actually listening to the Lord and, and um, reading his word? Jesus says he's so happy that his people keep his word. That's what makes us his people. We keep his word also. We keep his word. We put it inside of our lives. So are you spending that time to keep his word? Well, if you are, then go and do the things he's put inside of you. Enjoy your hobbies. Become the best at uh, everything you do. You know, enjoy and see what kind of influence the Lord opens up. Yeah, I just want to add, just piggyback off what you're saying. Sometimes we have, we've, we've secularized and we have, <laughs> holyized, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, made some this sacred and this not sacred, when in fact, the reality is that we're, so, we're actually called to live the sacredness of every day mm -hmm. uh, in everything that we do. It is a, in other words, the, the, what we place our hands to mm -hmm. because we have actual real value. It's not a theoretical value. It's a real value. Therefore, with what we do, we give real value to what we do. Mm -hmm. And there's a real th connection there theologically which we could discuss, but that we don't have enough time to right now. Um, but the idea is that that we've c either kind of fallen into this camp of either or. And so just hitting on, so I'm doing this, but I'm not doing God's work. Well, really? You know, when, do you, when can you not do God's work? Right. And so we need people. The church is called to be in all aspects of life and all spheres yeah. of life of influence to mm -hmm. do things well. And so now, obviously, God puts a call on your life, and you will have a direct thing that God will wrestle out with you, that you will wrestle out with God, and that's your journey that you're going to have to wrestle out. And so when, when does something become an idol? I would just add is that, that really it's anything that you place before God is just basically what it comes to, you know, including yourself when you say, God, I can't do that. You know, then you make yourself over the authority. I used to have a joke because I used to struggle with uh, uh, loving to jet ski. You know what the <laughs> best day to jet ski is? Sunday morning. <laughs> it just is. And um, it was always the most beautiful day. It was always when my friends were available. And somewhere along the line, um, God confronted me on that. And, you know, so I would let church be secondary to my priorities of needing to jet ski <laughs> and being out in the sun and water. And the Lord had a conversation with me on that, along with others. And you can guess where that ended up. And so, <laughs> yeah, once in a while, yeah, God will allow, will ask us to lay something down yeah. that doesn't seem to make sense. You know, I think of the, the Peter and the, the disciples, they, it's like they almost got asked to lay down their nets. And it was it brought in income and they needed it, but they actually laid down their nets and they followed Jesus. So sometimes that that will happen, yeah. but um, it's not necessarily I mean, there's but it's not always the case. You know, you, I think of Paul made tents and that's how he supported himself. Yeah. And Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. And, you know, she was key to starting a, a, a church in her location. Um, uh, Cornelius was a uh, soldier, you know, and God didn't tell him to stop being a soldier. But a church started in his house because of that. And Peter got a revelation at a butcher or like a, a tannery. You know, he was he was staying with a tanner and the tanner was not stole, told to stop tanning. You know, it's so God uses definitely marketplace and interest and all of that. But once in a while, we got to be obedient and lay things down when it doesn't make any sense, because that does happen sometimes. Yeah. Um, is that good? Go to the next one. Let's look at the next one. Um, OK, so these are. Um, kind of related, 
I think, but I think they're two different people. Um, asked them, I believe it says, how do Christians make sense of the need of boundaries in close relationships while Jesus teaches us to turn the other cheek? And I guess it means like, so Jesus is like, just say, take it. But we also feel like we need these boundaries. Um, how do you navigate through ending a toxic relationship with someone from church? I think Janice said she was ready to do that one, <laughs> <Sure>. right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, how do Christians make sense of the need of boundaries? Okay, so we can all agree that we need boundaries, right? Because um, some people can have unsafe, even abusive relationships or, or behavior patterns. And so, you know, we can agree that we want to have godly boundaries, but the boundaries that the world sometimes teaches us aren't, aren't Jesus's boundaries. So um, in this so this question is equating boundaries with Jesus's teaching of turn the other cheek, and it's kind of implying a boundary. But really, this um, reference, and I brought my, I just wanted to make sure that I quoted correctly, brought my little notebook here, where Jesus teaches about turning the other cheek. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> It's in um, Matthew, Matthew 5, 38 through 48. So if you read through that, um, Jesus is, isn't necessarily teaching about how to put boundaries on people. What, the, what this teaching is, is turning the other cheek, is about value and how our heart position towards other people and how our, because we have a relationship between each other, we have a relation, and how we how we position ourselves within our heart before the other person. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about we all have value, and no one is above the other, because we all stand at the foot of the cross together. We're all human, and so Patty has the same value that I have, and so he's talking about um, in in our heart. We turn the other cheek in the sense of realizing that we, we stay humble. What is your, when we're interacting with other people, what is your heart position before that person? Um, is it humble? And it's kind of a heart check, be humble. And then he talks next about how we take care of our, or how we interact with our enemies. Um, we we uh, pray for our enemies. And, and so it, this is, this is a, a heart condition and how we, um, interact with other people it, within our heart. Does that make sense? It's a little bit maybe of a different take on this passage than what you've heard. Um, I think about, I mean, because this is something that uh, I've never really been going through for a friend of mine who just has uh, in his head just a friend that he won't treat them right and then uh, purposely like just mistreat them and take advantage of them and just you know and they're like oh you know like forgive me but like you need to do the same thing over and over and like it's important to like turn our heart and give them for 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 say don't know what they're doing right and we all we all sin in some way and don't treat people right in some way at the same time you know when jesus was in positions where churches were rebuking him he didn't like stay and let them like burn and be burned mm -hmm. and there is something to be said for it like you know praying for people and loving people and forgiving people but i don't i don't believe that like you have to continually just give mercy to every mm -hmm. person that you know yeah. loves you yeah. you know and so yeah that's good so the the so the question is essentially asking that, right? Okay, so what's what's the what what are the rules on on boundaries? So um, you know we we want to make sure that when people are being unsafe and abusive, that we definitely put boundaries up. Um, but there is no clear cut. You know, there there's law. There's kind of rules and patterns to follow, um, but we want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes uh, there's been times that I have walked journeys with people 
um, and I've had to put very firm boundaries up on how they treat me. Like I give people permission on how they're going to treat me. Maybe not the first time, <laughs> but if if there's a, a pattern of behavior that I don't like, if I don't address it in a loving way and teach to it, then it will continue and then I become part of that. And so take responsibility to stand up in a loving way and be able to address how other people are are um, are treating you. But there, there have been, there's been times when I've, there's, there's a situation even in my family where I have had to say I'm not going to interact with this person. Very firm, like that's been the boundary. Whereas there's been other times, so there's been other times when it's been a little different and I've walked the road and there's been grace to do that. Um, so... <laughs> There, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and how to manage that. Um, and and this, you know, there are more, there are books on how to uh, manage boundaries. But in this sense, with equating, you know, turn the other cheek, I just wanted to make sure that that's a heart condition as a value that Jesus was teaching. I just want to add uh, on that, like talking about appropriate boundaries as well, working within that. It still comes back down to, so even in conflict, the other individual has value. What happens is that sometimes in conflict, and we will we'll have someone misquote scripture, uh, and they'll say, well, you just need to deal with it. You know, they're just, well, the way that we deal with it is biblically, which means that we speak truth into the circumstance. This is inappropriate for you to treat me this way. I have value, and you have value. This is what makes us very wrong. Because you have value makes it wrong when you abuse this person. Why? Because you have value just as much as that person. And so it's a breaking down uh, uh, of that. And so a very quick uh, this way of to thinking about it, though, is that when people are treating each other that way or there's kind of what we call toxicity in a relationship, it's because of brokenness. And so what is the response? What does Jesus say, you know, to love your enemy? To love our enemy is to what, though? What does that mean? Does that mean that we don't ever speak truth? No, Jesus actually, his entire ministry was correcting and speaking truth. Mm -hmm. And and I just want to give a quick example. Um, when you can understand that someone's broken and you can kind of take yourself out of the situation and say, this is a broken situation. How do I speak truth into this? Yet still value myself and still value them. Uh, you have to look at the greater picture. And so there's a time and this is, you know, this is, you want God moments. Um, and I've had lots of God moments and I've had lots of not God moments, failures, where you respond negatively to a circumstance that you feed into something. But I one time had a girl hit me and slug me one time in treatment. She attacked me and um, hard enough that my head snapped. She hit me that hard and she had put a bunch of rings on and, and, and she purposed that she was going to hit me. And so, um, staff. and I was staff. Yeah. And so that's immediately, in, in treatment, that's immediately a, a consequence. Aggression against staff isn't tolerated. So that's a complete level drop, meaning your program has just been almost completely shot. And so, um, but what you don't know was that her background was she had been really, really abused. Uh, she did not trust men. Um, and the, what was happening was that she was starting to trust. And so it was fearful for her. So she reacted out of fear because she said in her mind, I can't possibly trust a male because all males have hurt me and abused me. And so what she did was she said, I'm going to make sure that he, I can't trust him. So I'm going to give a situation uh, where he's not going to be able to trust me and that he's going to demonstrate that, um, that I don't have to trust him. And so she slugged me. And so this is one of those God moments, though, because one of her treatment program plan was to express her emotions appropriately. I say this only in the fact that when she hit me and I realized that I've been hit and I put my hand up and I'm figuring out what's going on and she's standing there like this, um, this was the God moment. Instead of responding to the, to the incident but speaking to the real issue, I, I said her name. And I said, I'm really glad that you're starting to express your emotions. But we're going to have to find a less painful way to do it. 
that was no. I have lots of not God moments where I fed into the negative behaviors just as. But that was a God moment, and my point was sharing that. And that was a boundary. That was a boundary. I just said this is not okay. You can't do this. But I, did I invalidate the individual? I didn't. Indi- I'm not going to take away her value just because she took away mine. Try to. And this is what Janice is saying: is that you, you. You have got to know. And I just share that. I have lots of stories where I failed miserably. I'll share those as time goes on. But I just want to point that out. Um, and I was going to say, you know, it's, it's interesting when I read that again. I read it a few times. Ending a toxic relationship in the church. So I would say may, maybe the first step is not ending the relationship, especially when it's in a church. It's more like tying everything together. Is um, well keep in, first keep in mind Matthew 18, right? When somebody, if you have somebody who has an offense against you, you have an offense against somebody. Jesus says you go to that person, right? You talk it over with that person, and if they won't listen, you take along somebody else. If they don't listen, you take along the elders of the church. If they don't listen, you take it to the whole church. The problem is, we do it upside down, right? We do it upside down. We have an offense with somebody, we take it to the church. The church doesn't listen, we take it to the elders. If they don't listen, we take it to somebody else with us. And then finally we go to the person and we're all heated up and we, you know, we have a fight. And so it should be like Jesus says, you go to the f- person first. Yeah. And, but and, if that, and, and in that conversation, it may be that you set those boundaries, right? And so I hate the idea of like ending it. Um, can there be some boundaries established? And, uh, you know, I had to walk that through with my own mother. Um, when Patty and I were dating and I brought Patty home, and my mom, you know, has, has some issues, and she just instantly decided she didn't like Patty. And, um, and I told my mom, I hate it that you're making me choose between you and, and my future wife, but I choose my future wife, you know. And I, I, created, a, I created a boundary, and I said, you're, you're, you know, this, this, it's, you're, you're overstepping where you belong now. I'm an adult, and this is who I've chosen. And, and it was tough, but it was, a, it was a boundary that had to be established. I had to tell my own mother, like, you can't go this way, right? You can't do this. Um, Bad choice. And one other thing that really gave me a lot of like breakthrough in terms of this is, um, yeah, my, 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 yeah, my mom, she's, I, you know, I don't think she'll ever listen to this. If you do, mom, let's have a conversation again. Um, <laughs> but, um, I had a professor at Bible college tell me one time, he says, just because you forgive somebody doesn't automatically mean you trust them again. And we often equate trust with forgiveness and trust with love. And sometimes the most unloving thing you can do is give somebody who can't handle trust a whole lot of trust, right? right? If they can't handle it, like like a child can't handle a knife, some people can't handle a a trust, right? right? And they'll abuse the trust. And so sometimes the boundary is, I'm not gonna trust you, but I love you interact with you and even with my mom I don't talk with her on the phone because when I'm on the phone I can't ignore all the negative stuff that comes through and so I have a I have a texting relationship with my own mother that we text once or twice a week and that way I can ignore all the negative stuff and just comment on the positive and so that's the boundary that's I haven't ended the relationship because I don't think I want to do that but at least I have put it at a level that we can maintain peace and harmony in our relationship in that way so yeah, I mean I, we could go on and on on that one. I think we'll move on. If that's all right. Yeah. Can Can I just so let's redefine toxic too. Um, it's more like broken, broken relationship. Yeah. yeah. Toxic let's reframe is a that. Popular word right now, but once we label it toxic, it's like you should never touch it. But when it's broken, there's opportunity yeah. for healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would just add this is where the church community comes in you know this is why a healthy church and healthy leadership is part of this and sometimes you know you can't you can't make anything you can't make someone believe you can't make you just bear witness to truth Mm -hmm. and so we do so in love we do so in compassion and sometimes it's frustrating because we want people to understand and we want people to see what with what they're doing is unhealthy and it's or a twisting of scripture and so but all we can do at the end of the day is pray for them 
and, and, and speak truth and be part of a biblical community that's going to... Can I just ask you to be honest with me that you're not talking about Muslim countries and how you feel? Um, sometimes I, I, I go back to every circumstance is a little bit different, and sometimes it is healthy. Uh, Paul mentioned his mom. My mom is very similar where I had, a very, I had to put very strict boundaries, and I had to limit my interactions. And so limiting interactions sometimes is the appropriate thing to do. I, th I think that we have to always remember, though, it really the scripture is clear. Yeah. We first go to them. Yes. We talk with them alone. You know, let's let's honor each other. Let's let's actually like follow that scripture. I think that's the hardest thing for most of us is to go to a person and talk to them about it. But as we do that, we can also remember other scripture that says that we need to conceal them better than they hide. Let's start there. Let's start in a spirit of humility and talk to them and see what the Lord can do there. And I just okay, this is my last two cents. <laughs> and so this is the part of conflict resolution that's the hardest thing to do, which is go to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, and so if you need help to do that, then I encourage you to talk with people that are leadership that will give you the tools to do that, but not just sit there and because we're going to hold. If you come talk to me about someone else, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, OK, well, how are we going to fix this? You need to go to that individual and we're going to work on this, the skill sets on how to go to that individual because they do have value just as much as you do. All right, we're going to try to do maybe one or two more questions. Here's an easy one. Who wants this one? Why does God love us? I don't know if it's easy or not, actually. I'm, I'm not going to say easy. There you go. Why, after all the bickering and fighting and toxic relationship stuff, why does God still love us? Patty. <laughs> but also because he created us. He created us. He formed us. The Bible says he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He, he formed you. And so he loves us, and he has a good plan for us. That doesn't mean we're actually walking in that plan all the time. And sometimes we get pretty ugly and unlovable, but I believe he still sees what he's created us to be. I, and you got something too, Christian. I think of, I think of uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament where God is in the process of judging his, his, his children, mm -hmm. the nation of Israel, and um, talking about what he's gonna do. And then he gets to a point, but he says, he says something like, how can I turn away from you, um, Ephraim? And he uses Ephraim, I had my friend uh, Chris Brandstetter, really good doctorate in theology, and he says that word that God used was almost like a pet name for little <laughs> baby Israel. And it's like God reminded himself in that moment, like, I'm very upset with you, but you are my little, my little Joseph, my little Ephraim that I, that I love and I will always love because you are my child. And, yeah, there's nothing that can take away the love I have for my own children, no matter what they would ever do. There's always going to be love because, you know, they are from us. You know, they came from the love of Patty and I, so how could I possibly turn away? And so God basically says the same thing. You're my child. How can I possibly um, turn my heart away from you? I'm going to create you. I just validate what Paul's saying is that oftentimes we struggle with God's love towards us because we're in the fallen, broken side of it where we've seen all the rejection. We've seen our own. We know how bad we really are on the inside. We can present very well to everyone around us. But we know every thought. We know every struggle that we've had. And we think, how in the world? Can God really love us and love me? Usually when, when people say, what, why does God love us? It's really, why does God love me? Mm -hmm. And so the qu the, you have to answer, which is that because you have real value. Mm -hmm. In God's eyes, God is our source of value. Mm -hmm. God is our source. He's our standard, not the world, not our circumstances. And scripture is very clear that while we were yet sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty profound and so we have a hard time uh, receiving the love of God for whatever reason mm -hmm. but the reality is that God does love us mm -hmm. and he demonstrated his love for us in and through the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and so and he and he wants family you know that we we think of God as so far off but really God's you know Jesus says you know um, uh, he talks about this in very familiar terms mm -hmm. like who's my brother who's my mother 
well, I tell you who my brother and my mother is and my sister. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It's those that, that listen to me, those that listen to the Father. Those are my brothers. Those are my sisters. It's, it's family. It's really, at the end of the day, God wants an eternal family with us. He, he wants the family with us is the best way that I can describe it right now. So. And, I, and I t- this thought just came to me, too. And um, he doesn't love us because we're lovable, right? <laughs> There's... That, that's not it. It says, God so, in, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have, last, have everlasting life. And so we couldn't do what it would be to be loved. So Jesus came and gave his life, right? And as Karen was talking about, we plead the blood. Without the blood, there's, there's nothing. So this love that God has for us is not just even a, a, it's not just a feeling. Like he took action. And despite the fact that we were in sin, Jesus died for our sin. He for our sin. He gave his gave his own son, died on the cross for us, right? So it's certainly, the answer is definitely not because we're lovable. And that's why we have a hard time receiving the love is because we know on the inside what jerks and what awful people we really can be, you know? And, and, and so to think that God would love us even though he knows us is hard to receive. And I'm just was gonna add on that in Hebrews 12, it says that without holiness, no one can see God. And that that's pretty profound when we think about that that you know god's already in a state of perfection he's already in a state that he desires relationship and he's paid the price that that relationship can happen he's made the way possible and what's fascinating with that is you know we desire relationship with god but oftentimes we're our own worst enemy within that which is oh no i just you know but god's made that way and so um you have that type of value because not only were we created in the image of God and then we've fallen and it's a fallen world and we've broken that relationship, but we have such value and such love from God that he's made the way for us to step into a place of holiness, to be in that for all eternity is, and family together. Like think of like this amazing how fun that would be. Like true, no no bickering, but perfect family, perfect relationship, perfect you know, just perfect. It's amazing. And that's good. That's good. Well, we've, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to say that uh, it's, I think it's important to note that um, God's power is limitless mm-hmm. and so his characteristics are limitless mm-hmm. and with the blood of Jesus, his love is limitless. Mm-hmm. 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 That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yep. Um, well, we would normally kind of be done by now. Should we, should we wrap up or should we do one more question? One more? Okay, that was the first vote I saw. It was one more question. <laughs> Come on Tuesday. Come on Tuesday. <laughs> All right, let's, let's bring on the next question. Oh, great, this one for us. Um, okay, if you could completely reimagine the model of Sunday church service, what would you do differently? Um, you know, I, <laughs> well, we're doing it right now, kind of, I mean, in a sense. Um, I've been thinking about that question, uh, and I would love to uh, even chat more with the person that asked it, but it came through anonymously, and but it, and it does say Patty as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? I th- I wanted to read um, First Corinthians, not First Corinthians. Why did I say that? Acts, um, Acts chapter two. It gives us uh, what it talks about the very first church, their very first times of gathering. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is uh, chapter two, verse forty-two. It says this early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Um, so there's certain elements, you know, that we just could never reimagine. Um, if anything, we can reimagine how they are presented, but there's certain aspects of when the church gathers, what do we do? You know, one, one thing the early church did is they devoted themselves <coughs> to the apostles' teaching. They, they wanted to hear, what is God saying? And, you know, the apostles, the elders would teach them the word of God, and so they would literally come together like we do, and what does the word of God say? And how are we not living according to it? How do we need to change to be in alignment with what God is speaking? 
and uh, you know just the elements of breaking bread together. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure, in one sense, that's talking about having communion, and we do that. But it's also just talking about sharing a meal. And that's why one thing we do is we stress just having meals together. And uh, that's how we started this church, right, is we begin to meet on Friday nights for meals together. And um, we started having prayer times before we ever started doing mm -hmm. what I guess we think of as doing church. I mean, that's what we're doing here today is having a time of, a time of church, if you will, mm -hmm. meeting together as a larger group. So, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I think there's these elements that you just have to have in place, and then you can play with those elements. You know, some churches, sure, they have the means, and they do the laser light shows and the fog, and whatever, that's fine. You know, is the word of God being preached? Are people given the opportunity to worship and fellowship together? Um, is there opportunity to break bread together? Um, and Caleb's got a question to <laughs> go for it. Maybe, I don't know, don't make it too complicated. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm getting to, um, right? So if anything, yeah, if any, what's that? <laughs> yeah, so if anything, after reading that passage, we, we definitely, have, we're, we fall short of the original church, mm -hmm. right? They were meeting together every day, mm -hmm. yeah, and they were, you know, sharing resources at a level that um, it's hard to imagine, but I don't know. What do you there was grace to I do that, yeah. though. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I'm not yeah. sure that every single one of them met with every single one of them every day. Mm -hmm. But what if it's more, hey, guess what? Five of you get together tomorrow, and you have lunch together, and then you see some friend walking by, and you invite them to your table, and then you start to talk about things. You know, what if it's more organic than all of that? You know, like, I think, I think if we just, like, wipe our memories of what we think of traditional church – suddenly we might be able to actually do what they're doing because we would just be meeting in an organic way like family and it doesn't have to have the big plans ahead of time we're just going to get together and we're going to talk about what Jesus is doing and we're going to talk about I read this scripture and I can't really understand it but I feel like the Lord's highlighting it and help me understand this and praying together and asking people how we can pray for them yes you know don't forget the communion level that mm -hmm. each of us has yeah they're holding up the same bread mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're all Did have a lot more things in common. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I think I almost answered the question that it, well, it does say Sunday church service, mm -hmm. but I think it'd be better for us to think about how can we reimagine church, you know? Exactly. Because in 2023 in America, we Im we, when we hear church, mm -hmm. we think of Sunday morning service, right? Mm -hmm. And so a church reimagined, not just the Sunday church service, but church reimagined would be that we are being the church. You know, we are being the church day in, day out. And we do accept the challenge of meeting together, but not as a whole belay large group, but meeting together for lunch and coffee and praying together and, and uh, spontaneous Bible studies that have been showing up on Slack. You know, I think it's exciting when uh, people just say, hey, I'm going to start doing a Bible study. <laughs> and it's good stuff, right? Yeah. And Ken, are you wanting to promo? Yes. <laughs> Well, it, it didn't come from the top down. It came from the bottom up. You know, it's, uh, we, we didn't ask for permission to do a Bible study. We just said, hey, we're going to do a Bible study. So yep, that's yep. exciting to me. Yep. Um, I have an awesome one. Um, five minutes of rooms instead of an hour of a church. Oh, that's you know, great. Everybody talks about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Woo! That needs to be on a T-shirt or a <laughs> coffee mug. Okay. Remember. Five, hey, hey, tell them on the lane. Do it. <laughs> Five minutes of realness is better than an hour of a circus when all you get is a bag of popcorn <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Paul, can I make a quick comment? Here. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think, so Francis Schaefer used to talk. Uh, you probably don't know who Francis Schaefer is. Uh, he's, he's one of my heroes of the faith. Um, and so he made a really great distinction. He said there's a difference between, uh, he wrote a book called The Great Evangelical Disaster um, on how, church can become just simply a um, a structure that's mm -hmm. cold and it's plastic yeah. but neither at the same time you know should church be just an experience d apart from truth and really at the end of the day he was saying that there's a difference between form and function um, and the function of church can never change it's it, that deals with our relationship with the living God with Jesus Christ the purpose of why Jesus uh, paid the price but in scripture, there's really a lot of freedom the way that that can play out mm -hmm. in form. 
um, but it still has to be the same function. And that, and, and Paul is really speaking to, I just want to just validate what you're speaking to, which is, you know, it's really relationship. Mm-hmm. Church is about relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, we come together as a whole group, uh, little groups, um, individuals, and it's really about at the end of the day, and you said it, and I'm just going to validate it again, which is it's really about family. We're family. <laughs> And um, where do we need, you know, so, sometimes we call, right? And we, we make these big plans and other times, but when do we just stop being family? We, we don't. So anyways, mm-hmm. that's all. Well, I think, I think it'd probably be good to, to wrap things up um, now. Sorry about that. We, but we have another, I think we have 15 slides. So we actually have one or two more questions that we'll try to be get through on Tuesday night. So this would be a great week if you want to try Tuesday. Um, see what see what it's like at the Bella House. Um, you're welcome to come on out. Um, what do you so not now? No, I want people to. I want us to actually want to do this again. <laughs> if we Heiko, if we punish people and make them sit here another half hour. Like the next time, the next the next time we say we're going to do an interview, like okay, I'm checking out. I'm going to eat. But we don't want that to happen. Um, So I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and um, yeah, these are great questions. Thank you to those who submitted, and when it comes up again, feel free to throw in a question that's on your minds and heart. Um, I think it's really beneficial um, for us to kind of hear what's going on in the minds and hearts of our family here. So Lord, we thank you so much just for um, the questions that were on people's minds. Um, Father, we pray for breakthroughs in areas of relationship that, um, Lord, you give wisdom and uh, mm-hmm. you give grace to people to have conversations that yeah. need to be had. Yeah. Um, and, Lord, we pray for just as for us as a church community mm-hmm. that, um, Lord, that we would always have those, um, those functions of preaching your word and having godly fellowship. But, Lord, help us to flow when it comes into those forums and how that comes about. Lord, uh, we don't have to have a building, and we're here in a house, and it's good but lord if you ever change that give us the hearts to be obedient and to follow mm-hmm. after your spirit yeah, um, to follow the plow to follow the fire to know where the spirit of god is leading us and so help us to never be married to a certain uh, form but to always be um, just right in the heart of the function that you want your church to do here mm-hmm. in boulder yeah. so lord we pray for uh, just your help just to continue to follow your spirit and all we do bless this day now bless each person here and He's listening. This is now Tuesday night. Um, (laughs) Okay, there you go. Um, Now, one thing we did on Sunday, and I know some of you were there, some of you weren't, but one thing we did is that we we received um, Christian as really our first official elder, other than myself. So. We just so we prayed over that. So we just want to welcome Christian in that capacity. But mm-hmm. and actually, they, they're a ministry couple that has, has served for 30 years in, in ministry, just like us. And so it's exciting. And so if you want to know what a really what an elder is, an elder um, in the Bible serves as basically a shepherd. You know, it's it, the elders um, in a sense provide leadership for the church. And so um, Christian is already serving on something we call the advisory council that um, we're going to begin to m- begin to meet more often. And um, anyway, I'm just really grateful mm-hmm. for both Christian and Janice. So it's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting to see um, Belay begin to develop, right, beyond, beyond just Paul and Patty and the Durbin's <laughs> house. <laughs> we're excited for that um, anyway. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to repeat the very first question we did on Sunday. And really, it's just an opportunity for Christian and Janice to introduce yourselves. Um, there were some ideas there. Um, can you tell us more about your story up until this point? Kind of who are you and what brought you here? And what do you think God's call is on your lives here in Boulder? So just sort of a, a quick little, well, whatever. It doesn't have to be quick, but an introduction of sorts. All right. So um, let's see here. I'm trying to think of what I said. Yeah, no, I'm trying to make it different. Um, different font. Same message. So, so it was a, a little bit of a process coming here. Um, we had been at the, our church, as some of you know this, uh, for 10 years uh, in California. And it was a bunch of mir- miracles that took us from Reno, Nevada to California, uh, where all of this landed. And so um, it's really, really kind of 
unconventional in the sense that we weren't looking to leave. Um, we had been partnered with Belay uh, in prayer and with the Durbans uh, for prayer in China. And then when they uh, felt called to come here uh, as a family and plant a church, we had just been in process of praying with them. And then um, coming to visit, uh, Janice had an inkling. Uh, I didn't have that inkling to start with. And so then she brought it up to me and I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, I mean, and it's exciting, but at the same time, it's you're you're invested. And and I think that us coming here is just a great reminder of how God moves in our life, that you don't want to be stagnant, just always open to what he's doing. And, um, you know, because we're, we're kingdom building, we're not that might happen locally, but we don't want to trench in somewhere. We want to be just uh, ebbing and flowing with what God would have. And so we're, we're very excited to be partnered with them as well, Paul and Patty, because uh, we just look at, we just think you guys are amazing as well. And so, um, you know, we're not all like, hi, well, you're great. You know, <laughs> um, but it's, but there is, there, it's, there is this kind of this joy coming here uh, that's like, wow, this is, this is fun. And this is, we get to partner with people that are uh, serious in ministry and have a huge track record and, um, so it's exciting. So I don't know if that helps or not. That was really that's great. Not and I, clear. And I know many <laughs> of many of you guys have already talked with Christian and Janice, so you have a little bit of their story as well. But you know, we're just we're super grateful that they heard the call and obeyed and came. You know, it's super exciting. Um, and they're 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 both working full time, and and they're working in. I think very ministry centric jobs are they're, they're doing ministry, but they're not, you know, we're and Belay doesn't have any employees. We don't have any staff, um, including myself and Patty. Um, we're on mission support right now. And both of them are working in, in public health, not mental health, I would say, not, not, not public health, but mental, mental health. So anyway. All right. So let's move on to the next questions. And um, so it says, what happens next after we outgrow the Durbin's house? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? We shout, for joy. <laughs> we shout for joy. Yeah, there'd be some Durbans probably shouting for joy. Um, no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. I really am. We're, we're kidding. I mean, no, you're not. There's some young Durbans <laughs> that would maybe do that. There were some young Durbans that would. Um, you know, I've been. I, I knew that question was on there, and I think it's a really good question. And honestly, we've we've even asked the same questions ourselves. We've asked God the same question. You know, what do we do? Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's been interesting to see how things have snowballed on Sunday morning um, to where even a year ago, uh, that wouldn't have been a question we felt like was very urgent. But in, in just, just in the last few months, it feels like, oh, we should probably be, you know, God should probably be speaking about this real soon. So I think, you know, I would just say, like, our, our heart, um, you know, is not necessarily that let's go find a, Let's go find a building and let's start paying rent or let's start paying a mortgage. That's not what is really on our minds. Um, I have a few things that like I would ask God for. One thing we're asking him for and would love to see happen would, um, you know, what if there was another home like in northern Boulder that would open up? Mm -hmm. um, we realize now that it would take <laughs> a super special call for somebody to do that. Um, it's not something you could just say, hey, are you free Sunday morning? Um, could we have people start showing up at your house? You know, it's, it's a much bigger request than that. So I think, I mean, God really has to be involved in uh, putting it on somebody's heart to do such a thing. So that would be great um, if that would happen. Um, we're also just, you know, God has done miracles. One thing God has done is that he's done miracles to get us here. And I feel that every miracle has been for us a training ground um, for us to believe for even more miracles, right? I don't believe every miracle was a stopping point. Okay, from then on, after this miracle, you got to work on your own. Um, so our house that we're living in is a miracle. Um, the truck that we're driving is a miracle. Um, just uh, the fact that people are gathering in our home, we feel is a miracle. So I just, I feel like, I just really believe God's not done with, he doesn't, he's not out of miracles yet. So if that means opening up another home, cool. Um, if it means that somebody says, hey, we're not using this building downtown Boulder, would you like it? <laughs> we'll say, yeah, sure, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain amount of tension, right? You, you do want to plan. Okay, I get that. 
But I also am very comforted by the fact that when God called Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to go to the country. I will show you. Mm -hmm. But he had to start walking first, right? So, and that's, and God did that with his people a lot. Um, He took Philip, who was having great experience in ministry, and he said, Philip, I want you to go out to the desert road and just, just go. You know, Philip, the, we, Philip wasn't told there's going to be anything up in Munich there waiting for you that you're going to preach to. He just said, go to the road. And so Philip just starts out walking. Um, and so God's people have often been told to begin walking before the provision yeah. comes, right? Yeah. The Israelites sent out into the desert with no provision, right? And uh, God began to supply. So that's really my best, my favorite answer is that God is going to provide when when we need. But but we're praying and we're we're thinking about that. Mm-hmm. But as far as an exact answer, I don't have one mm-hmm. right now. Do you? <laughs> I think the biggest thing is we don't want to limit God. You know, we don't want our dreams about the next step to be so specific that we don't see His actual answer when it comes to us. Mm-hmm. You know, so we want to just be. We want to be able to move into his will wherever he leads us. Um, and he used, a, used that example of Abraham, you know, um, going when the Lord called him to go, you know. But he also, s- I remember Abraham also saying, I'm not going to go where your spirit's not. If you don't go with us, don't take me from this place. Moses, sorry. Don't, if you don't go with us, don't take me out of this place. So that's, yeah, that was him. Yeah, and I love Abraham's answer. Sorry, it's been you too. Abraham's answer to Isaac when Isaac said, hey, we're going to do the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham actually said, the Lord will provide, right? We'll go and the Lord will provide. I mean, in his mind, he's thinking it might end up being Isaac, but I don't think he really thought that. I really believed, he believed God was going to provide. So, yeah, there's not, we're not going to have to accept, like, leftovers. Um, it's. I think it's going to be good, the next step, so... What were you going to say, Kristen? I was just going to add that yielding to the moment with what God would have for the provision, it, you know, is that's the key. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you guys have spoke to that very specifically. And just I just want to share very quickly that when we were in California, the church that we were at, uh, when we first went, was very impoverished. And everyone had these ideas. Um, that were kind of far away on how things should be done in order to get things taken care of. And, um, and the Lord led me directly opposite of that. And the leadership, you know, there was this mm-hmm. unity. And God provided in the most miraculous ways things that people thought would never happen. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it all stemmed out of just the circumstances and conversations and having relationships in the community and being a witness where things came together that you can't make happen, um, you, there's no way to force it. And anyways, and I believe that's going to be with Valerie as well. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a miracle, yeah. and yeah. it's going to be good. Yeah. Cool. Two questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, no, I would be thinking more like two, mm-hmm. two different groups kind of growing. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess whatever works for that mm-hmm. family, yeah. It, it just it could be either one, yeah. Yep, Caleb. Like when? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Especially in the winter time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I've, I've in my head, I've kind of thought seventy-five is probably kind of stretching it. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's actually that's actually the next plan. That's the plan. We're gonna go talk with Coach Prime, and say, uh, <laughs> "Hey, what are you doing with Folsom Field on Sunday morning?" Um, no. It kind of feels like when it's time, it'll be time, and the provision will be made manifest you know yeah I agree yeah and so like why sweat it (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) I don't know I don't know it's a good question though it is Caleb it's and I don't even know how this fits in with this but I'm just so reminded of um just like two weeks ago week and a half ago 
the owner of our house finally came to visit us like you many of you've already heard this you know but the owner finally came to visit and see the house for the very first time and while he was with us he again shared the story of his own salvation and it was a family in a golden area that just had a heart for people had a heart for the Chinese immigrants specifically and that family invited a whole bunch of Chinese immigrants to their house every Sunday morning like 10 families with their children would show up at this person's house and they would they told them they were teaching English using the Bible and they were actually having a worship service and the kids would go with the adult children of this family and they would do Sunday school and teach them English using the Bible and Sunday school and and that's what led to this miracle you know so who knows what God's gonna do because that's just such a different kind of story you know what I mean and just amazing fruit from that so yeah no, that was that was super fun to hear again um, all right well let's let's do the next one um, so here's a good question uh, how would you go about studying the Bible and church history systematically today? Bible college, seminary, Bible studies, online courses, other methods? That's a good question for Christian, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, all of it. Um, I think the key is just the hunger to pursue the deeper things. And so um, meaning, you know, go after, go after deep, deep studies uh, is what you do and it's you know it's one thing to take a little book you can even take a great book read it real quick and get a little bit of knowledge out of it but it doesn't mean much because you weren't really hungry for it mm -hmm. and so if you're really hungry for it it really starts with just really reading scripture and then as you read scripture I think the best way if you're not going to go off to a bible school or a bible college is you read scripture and then you get a really good um, historical commentary and the thing is that you have to remember is there's lots of people's of opinions and so the key is is that you ground yourself in scripture mm -hmm. read it consistently um, and then you when you see a place name uh, like Akron or wherever uh, Moab and all these different places immediately um, if you're not in a quiet time there's a couple different ways to study but you go and you look on the map you start looking up what that city is and then you start you start being able to build a historical knowledge of the way scripture is being developed the history that's taking place because it's real people real places and real events and so it's intertwined in history mm -hmm. and then as you do that though the key is um, there's a lot of people that will study but they don't know the God that it speaks to and so uh, head knowledge is one aspect of it, uh, but really it's relationship with the living God ultimately mm -hmm. as to be hungry towards in the study of that. So yeah. that's what I would yeah. have to say. Yeah, that's good. I would add as to that is, uh, you know, watch, watch like who are you listening to? And because there's so many choices available now that we didn't have, like when we went to Bible college, if we wanted to study, go join be a part of ministry like bible college is one of just a few options but now i know there's lots of stuff online but i think with that we, d we definitely got to be careful and say who is this person that's speaking to me that has this opinion you know what is their life like are they connected to anybody else are they accountable to any sort of board or just ministry or church and um because I, I i know that with facebook and youtube whatever you watch it's going to give you a little bit more extreme of that. And if you like it, it's going to give you a little bit more extreme of that. And pretty soon you're listening to people that are you know, kind of way out there in left field. So we definitely got to be careful with you know, some of our online choices and find people that you can kind of know their life. You know, I think if Paul told Timothy, he says, watch your life and your doctrine closely, mm -hmm. because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really easy now to get online and all we get is somebody's doctrine, but we have no idea about their lifestyle, yeah. you know, and, and who they are and really what they truly stand for. So that's one thing to be careful of. Yeah, that's well. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Yeah. Um, I think the issue is the people who study Bible that have a bigger mental capacity. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like right. Right. Um, but also, like, I would say, like, 
That's good. That's good. Yeah, in fa- I've this, I don't know if this relates, but we've had some of these Jehovah's Witnesses come to our door a couple times, and I just c- converse with them a little bit, and I, I looked up a little bit about their version of the Bible that they use, and they claim that they're, I think it's called the New World Translation of the, of the Scriptures. They claim that it was put together by a board of, of scholars, but they keep those scholars... Um, like secret, <laughs> like you don't get to know who they are. <laughs> like that's not very helpful, right? good yep i wanted to add having a full the full council of the scriptures sometimes we get we we have this pet idea that we just go back to over and over and over and over again but i really i i just find that if i'm just constantly reading the word and just getting a, a diet of all of the word you know read the bible every year go through it read it again and then read it again and then and then study more deeply into certain areas i think that we have a lot more balance and we have more discernment that way and the, the thing that made me grow more than anything was when I was put in a place where I had to teach others. And so I think that's a general principle. You, a teacher learns more than their student does all the time. So look for opportunities even to begin to teach, to host a small Bible study, to whatever it might be, mm-hmm. because that's, I, that's when I begin to grow by leaps and bounds. Yeah, Absolutely. Studying to pass a test is a lot different than studying to present. Yeah. And... Um, Absolutely. So put yourself out there um, to to have those discussions and to to pursue. And I think all of this was really good. And the only other thing that I might would add is just that um, I'm not really adding. I'm just going to reinforce it. Is read your Bible mm-hmm. um, and really look at the Bible dictionary in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you think that sometimes a Bible dictionary, like if you go to the store, sometimes there's slants to them, you know. And so you really want to dialogue with what has been said with with the greater community on on what's being discussed. And so if you read something and if you feel like it shakes your faith, um, just go and dialogue and say, what, what are your thoughts on this? Mm-hmm. You know, is this really true? Mm-hmm. And what's the criticism of this? And so really the onus is kind of on you to wrestle it out mm-hmm. truly. And I know that sounds redundant, but oftentimes we do go to those echo, ch- echo chambers mm-hmm. and uh, we don't want to do that. So. All right, let's look at the next question, (laughs) which is, what was the most significant thing that God has done for you? Wow, that could take all night, (laughs) right? (laughs) Who's going first? The most significant thing God has done for you. (laughs) I would say, honestly, I mean, maybe getting a few brownie points here and all of that, but for sure, but this is honest truth, (laughs) putting Patty in my life. God bringing Patty into my life. That has got to be, I don't know what would be, I don't even know what would take take place over that. That's the most significant for me. Sorry, Christian, I already used that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's just true, uh, you know, just a godly mate. I am just, I'm blessed. Anyway. I would it's I would just say outside of salvation, um, I'm just going to say uh, family as a whole, and I mean our f- biological family, church family, it's community, you know, biblical community, um, because when we first came to know the Lord, or I did, uh, I was just before my 20th birthday, and you know I was so amazed because I had called a friend to go to a party. 
um, and I hadn't seen him since I used to party a lot and I hadn't seen him through the summer and so I had come back to Reno and he said oh no I can't go and I'm like well why why can't you go and um, he's like well and he was hemming and hawing I'm like come on it's it's college is starting again you know it's back to school party blah, you know and he goes well I'm going to a bible study <laughs> and I'm all a bible study a bible study what do you mean a bible study and I was kind of getting on him and someone in the background said invite him to come and um and he's and and, and, and and my and the friend said he wouldn't want to come he doesn't like this type of stuff and then sure. so then he asked me and i said uh well are there any cute girls there <laughs> and he said well yeah and uh so i'm like okay well i'll go and then i'm gonna go to the party afterwards and that's what i did and i went but i was amazed at the the kind of juxtaposing I guess is the word I'm looking for going from that then to the party and it was like and then I went back and then I went back again and then anyways and that's where I met Janice and so uh, um, but but it was so substantively different the community that was there than the community that I thought I had. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways. So, and that's, that's the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. I think um, freedom. Yeah. Like, freedom. Freedom. Freedom to be myself. Freedom to be holy. Uh, you know, the just, I mean, salvation. But then the outcome of that, you know, John 10, 10. Like, living life abundantly. Like, the promise. And it's really attainable. Like, <laughs> it's uh, healing, healing from bondage and um, deliverance. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that. freedom. I agree with all of it. Else. There's just so much. It's really hard to actually just yeah. say this is the most significant yeah. thing. My mind's thinking of so many things. I think, I think one of the most significant things is probably being filled with the Holy Spirit in a way where all of a sudden scripture came alive. Yeah. Things I'd read the Bible over and over again as a kid. I was part of this group called the Missionettes where girls would read the Bible and be challenged to memorize scripture. And I didn't get a thing out of it until the day I felt like the Holy Spirit came on me in a new way. And all of a sudden I remember reading the Bible again after that. I mean, I had done it. I'd done it dutifully, you know. But after that, I just remember reading through the book of Romans and it being like lights were turning on. Um, like uh, there was this new understanding and a passion and a love for the scripture and, and challenge to live differently. So, yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's look at the next one. Which is, what is a verse or a book in the Bible that you've struggled with and what did your wrestling look like and coming to a place of peace, or maybe not. Well, what comes to mind? <laughs> I'll just jump in. This I don't know. So, like when I first came to know the Lord, I was really, uh, for the first couple of years, I was really reading like. Bible dictionaries and trying to find out information and um, and I think that you know there's there's absolute claims there's there's hard phrases in Scripture but what I think that I wrestled out with um, specifically was actually appropriating the promises to me mm -hmm. that God had and not saying I could believe that for someone else but I don't necessarily believe that for me and so. And, and that came out within the call of ministry that came into our lives where I didn't want to do ministry. But part of that was, um, you know, I just didn't feel like I was worthy. You know, I was a horrible student, caused so many issues in school at times. Um, I got a special award at graduation for causing the most uh, arguments in class. <laughs> and um, I really did. It was totally, it was not good. And... Um, and Janice knew my anger, like stuff that I struggled with. Um, you know, I had no problem chasing people down to have an ish talk with them. Um, 
and and when that came and looking at scripture and going back to what janice said you know freedom that like i can actually be free and i can actually be called you know it was that's what i wrestled over with more than than you know there's some hard there's definitely some hard passages in scripture Mm -hmm. but it was just simply appropriating the promises that god would have for everyone but also me Mm. that's good and we don't all have to answer everyone as well because we've got i think technically five more questions so unless one of you guys one of you girls wants to answer that one um i saw this question from Sunday, and um, I don't have a specific verse that I, it really I was wrestling with, but more just the context of God's love for me, mm-hmm. um, especially when it came to pain. God's love for me, knowing that I'm his daughter, and then how he allows pain into our lives, and he allows mm-hmm. suffering. Um, I felt like I had a lot, I felt like I had victory over that whole thought um, when I had all my babies at home without a doctor. I thought, okay, I've experienced pain and I've gone through it and, and it's, I have had victory. But then in China, um, when I shattered my kneecap, that was tough because I felt like I'm walking in obedience. I'm a child of God. I'm called here. How, why did God allow this? And then I healed and then I did it again. I shattered my same kneecap again. And that's when it got really ugly of trying to understand how a good good father allows pain into his children's lives and he does and and he could stop it but he allows it sometimes and for me i had to be reminded over and over again of how good he'd been for me and i had to go to the word and i had to have some really ugly words with god there were sundays i couldn't go to church because i couldn't bend my knee to go down the stairway and i couldn't bend my knee to use a squatty potty at the church in china and so I'd be home, and everybody else would be gone, and I would have screaming matches with Jesus, mm. crying the ugly cry, until, like, he, it's almost like he just let me cry it out, and, and then it felt like he just gave me a hug and said, I'm still here, and I still love you, and it wasn't something you did wrong. I allowed this for your good, and for good for the good of others around you. Kind of like the book of Job. In the book of Job, God chooses Job to go through some really ugly things to bring glory to him. And I don't understand it, and it's hard to understand it, how our good, good father allows the pain. But he does. And in the midst of all of that, he is with us, and he is good. And I would not take that pain away and stop that hold. If I can go back, I'd let it happen again. Because I learned so much about his nearness and his love for me and his kindness and his strength and the love of the people of God. So I don't, it's really hard. It's, I still struggle with it. And I don't, sometimes I don't know how much I can dr- really trust him because I know he allows major pain. Mm-hmm. But I know I can trust him. So. Mm. All right. Good. Let's look at the next one. Um, what are the toughest obstacles you face as a Christian living in Boulder? The toughic, uh, toughic, uh, toughic, <laughs> toughest <laughs> obstacles. <laughs> I was putting the two words together. Um, hmm. What have you guys? Have, uh, have you experienced anything that you would describe as tough? You're not living. I know you're. I mean, you're Boulder County Superior. Has there been anything fresh? fresh here no no it's i would just say it's it's the same brokenness it just looks different here Mm. yeah but it's still brokenness um it's a broken fallen world everywhere yeah and so i would say as far as obstacles here um i don't know do you have anything that you would say i mean the company that i work for is pretty interesting and i want to be mindful they've been very gracious to me uh, but i'm definitely the odd person there um and but God is working miracles through that, I would say, and opportunities. And so with that said, um, I don't know if it is any different or any, you know, let's see, unique for Boulder necessarily. Yeah. 
Um, I think uh, one thing that we encountered when we first got here after living in China and being a part of an international church and there was what they call an expat community. Expats are just, you know, people that aren't from China, Americans, Australians and all of that. UK, Asians, you know, from different countries. Uh, we, you were able to make relationships so quick. Um, you just bonded with people very, very quickly and you became best friends literally within almost hours, you know. And it was such, it was quite a, um, quite a surprise, quite a shock coming back where it just felt it was much tougher to just break into somebody's relationship circle. And then, uh, and then that was compounded and exasper exacerbated by uh, COVID when that came along. So that would have been the toughest for us is just going from just lots of relationship and then the first year and a half where there was felt like there was hardly any relationship. And of course, that's not a problem now. We know we're surrounded by like what Christian said, this relationship is so good, but that's been tough. Mm -hmm. And maybe the prices. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, you know, we've only been here, I think six weeks, but so, and, and we're not living in Boulder, but we do are catching a little bit of a different spiritual atmosphere mm -hmm. than in California. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having yeah. to shift, I, you know, I'm kind of having to kind of, adjust to that um it's not any worse or any better necessarily it's just a little different than california um so not so much culturally but more like spiritually like our the spiritual warfare we're facing is slightly different um we're sleeping better here so the spiritual warfare has shifted it's just you know so we're kind of and that happens you know when you go to other countries or other different regions of the country, mm -hmm. spiritual warfare will feel different and the atmosphere and the spirit will feel different. Um, and so I, for me, it's just that, mm -hmm. yeah. But we've had, we've made, been making friends. Um, we feel c you know, welcomed by the community, like, you know, in Superior and people here. I mean, yeah, so as far as like the liberal that's bent. That's almost been easier for you. It yeah. has been easier. As, ca as far as the liberal bent, um, we, you know, that's kind of, I mean, we, We've worked for, I worked for this for the county in California. I worked for the state of Nevada. You know, I mean, yeah, we're kind of used there. to that. <laughs> you work, you know, so that's that's kind of that's not yeah. anything new. Yeah. I think the hardest thing for me is that there's so many people around us that really have rejected any idea of truth. Um, that's really been hard, you know, that like they're, I love that they're all open to any kind of spirituality so I can talk about Jesus and I can talk about what he's done for me and what he's showing me, but, and they'll, re Oh, that's nice. That's, I love, that's nice that you have your truth, you know? Um, so that's hard. And also just the fact that I've been with certain people working with certain people for a long time now here that um, just can't get through to their, them that I am a sinner. They like to say, Oh, you're just such a nice person. I'm not a nice person. I'm a sinner, and I have lots of selfishness, but it's Jesus that is showing you kindness and love through me. And so that's what I want, I want, you know, and I'm sick of being, people saying I'm a nice person. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I think the bottom line is, no matter how tough a place might be, um, if God has you there, he gives you the grace to yeah. be there too. And I think that's, m overall, that's what we've experienced. We just yeah. experience a grace to be here, you know. Just that's just the bottom line. Yeah. Um, let's look at the next one. Number 12. What are some areas of apologetics that you've found most effective when having spiritual conversations with people in Boulder? Um, so I, you know, I'm not, I know, I know Christian has studied apologetics and he was part of a group back in Bible college. Apologetics is, is when you have, you're, you're defending the truth of the gospel. So if, if you, you can give an apologetic, it's not apologizing for, it's a different kind of meaning. An apologetic would be, this is why I believe what I believe, and this is why that's logical, this is why this is believable, that's the idea of apologetics. You're giving a, a, a logical, good defense for what you believe. That's, that's what it means to have apologetics. Um, for us, uh, I mean, for me, I, you know, I don't know that I've, I've never been, like, good at debate, um, I've, I've never been one that I would consider to be super persuasive. Um, but one thing that we felt was important as we came to Boulder is that we would have listening ears and that we would ask more questions than we would, um, than not, you know. 
So we would have questions on our lips, uh, seeking to understand. It's the whole idea of, you know, you seek, seek to understand before being understood. So that's really been Patty and I, that's been our mode and opening our home and allowing conversation to take place. And um, there's been a few moments, yeah, where we, even just on Saturday, I went for a walk with a guy that considers himself a uh, agnostic. Mm -hmm. And there was a few moments in our, I think we spent four hours together. I wasn't planning on that, but that's what it ended up being. We were together for four hours. And um, there were a few moments in there where I, you know, said a few bold things about creation and what have you but for the most part I was asking him questions mm -hmm. and I think sometimes a person can begin to see their own logical fallacies as they articulate what they supposedly believe yeah. and oftentimes they don't even really know fully what they believe yeah. and yeah. so that's been my method mm -hmm. questions um, I, I would just yeah I, I think what Paul's saying um, is really important is that that with apologetics, yeah, I have studied a lot of apologetics and different systems, and um, my master's degree dealt with apologetics. Um, and there's a place for knowledge, but I just want to read scripture, and this is key. And so in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Um, apologetics first starts with our relationship with the living God. Um, and then it says, always be ready, and this is the word apologia, uh, where we get this from, always be ready to make a defense for anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. That's the apologia. Mm -hmm. But if you notice, it starts first first with sanctify, sanctify, sanctification, sanctification of relationship. Um, that's where it starts with, which is a relationship. And so um, I don't like debates so much anymore like I used to when I was younger because a lot of times it just becomes who presents the best evidence wins the debate but really there's no truth it's just it's just a debate and so we want truth well what's the truth Jesus says I'm the way the truth and the life you know no one comes to the father except through me and he says truth aletheia um, and meaning that and truth is the standard it means he's the very standard by which all things are measured by all things not just not just an idea but all things that means relationship that means love that means sacrifice that means holiness that means obedience that means um this compassion to chase after the one you know and within that i would just say that that within all of this in acts chapter 1 3 when jesus rose from the dead and it says that he was, uh, and don't get me wrong, and discussions are really, really important, but they have to be guided discussions in relationship. And so I would go to Acts chapter 1, 3, where it says that Jesus rose. Uh, when he rose from the dead, he spent many days with uh, the apostles and with the disciples. And it says a very peculiar word, and I think it's only used once in Scripture. Uh, and if you read it, it'll look like it says Tecmarian. That's not how you pronounce it, but that's close enough for now. Tecmerian. Uh, and the, but it's the idea, it says, many infallible proofs he gave. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Tecmerian means, is many infallible proofs. But he does that in the midst of the people. Mm -hmm. And so the many, once again, it comes back down to this idea of presence, mm -hmm. of truth being manifest mm -hmm. in every way, including the ideas, including the logical stuff, but not at the cost of relationship. And that's what actually gives meaning to the relationship. So you have truth like a structure, but then there's the substance that has to take place within that structure. And that's the presence, that's the Holy Spirit, that's the living God interacting. And so, so, so with that, and so you do, I would say one of the things that I would approach with is that listen to what people are saying, listen to the assumptions that they're making, because most people will say, well, that's a great truth, but then they make a truth claim. And so you recognize they can't escape truth, and so the idea is in relationship, you're going to lead them to truth or bear witness to truth, which is ultimately Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you do, you do wrestle that stuff out, but it's spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I can't encourage enough is that I used to be very cerebral in the discussion, and I wouldn't be praying for their deliverance. I wouldn't be praying for the scales to come off of their eyes. I wouldn't be praying for um, 
the demonic that's been manifest in their life to be to be set free from that and that has that's just as important and that's a whole another strain of thought there so i won't go down that but (laughs) but there is kind of this three-pronged approach with that uh, with deliverance evangelism um and discipleship is kind of intertwined you know in i'm going to go down that road so i'm going to stop right there (laughs) that's good christian (laughs) oh thanks yeah relationship and that's what we've been about at belay since the beginning we're forming a community um truth is proclaimed but in the context of relationship over a meal right where we're demonstrating love to people all right i think there's three more questions let's do them rapid fire and we'll bring this to a close we're at about 40 minutes right now a little over 40 minutes so this is for me i guess okay right um it says how can we find the balance be- to to thank and give credit to god when something good happens while also wanting to give ourselves credit because of our own hard work and dedication um <laughs> Interesting. I don't know why that one was for me either. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's what I said. This is for Paul. <laughs> All right. Um, I think, you know, honestly, we just be honest. You know, I think it's, th- I think humility looks false when we just say, oh, no, never, you know, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I mean, I think if somebody comes and says, thank you for something, I've always just felt honesty is a pest policy. And you just say, you know, you're welcome. Thank you for that. And I think you just, you're, you're honest. You give glory to God for what he has done. And, but yeah, oftentimes the things that we accomplish, it, it was us saying yes and following through and being obedient and taking a risk. And I think we acknowledge that too, but we can even give glory to God for giving us the faith to take a risk, um, giving us the grace to say yes. But yeah, I think, I think just not be fake in our humility and, um, yeah, just honest. I don't know. We'll just make that real quick. That's a good question, though. Let's look at the next one. Um, how do I leave room for God in my life when I have so much else going on? One one person answer. It looks like it's Janice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just priorities and value system, and that's part of growth, you know? Like, um, when I first, when I first really started um serving the lord i was working on sundays and it seemed like such a sacrifice to not work on sundays because i would lose however much money that day and i was a student and you know and so i just came down to a place where i had to make the choice and i had to lay that down and trust god with to make ends meet and he did and so um that's you know it just it comes down to value system but it's a growth process so we're not, you know, everyone's growing. Give, so, give everyone some grace and give yourself some grace. All right. Do we have one or two more? Just one more. Okay. <laughs> I think this was Tian's question right here. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that out loud. No, that's fine. <laughs> Do you think the rise of popularity of the Passion Translation does more harm than good? How many are familiar with the Passion? Oh, yeah, you're right. It, she, had, she had quotes, air quotes around the... Um, or actual quotes around the word translation. How many are familiar with the Passion Translation? Okay. Well, you know, I, I said we were going to make this quick, but, and so rather than opening up a whole can of worms, I would just say myself, I don't, I don't care for the Passion Translation, and the reason is a couple of reasons why. <laughs> a couple of reasons why is I, I, I feel they lack transparency in what they're, who they are and what they've created. Um, the Passion Translation seems to present itself, if you go to their website, as being translated by a whole group of scholars, right? Like um, Meg was talking about earlier. But nowhere on the website do they give you the names of those scholars. And so that's when it starts sounding like a very sectarian, like a very, um, uh, like a secret. Why is it a secret? Why can't I know the names of the people that were doing this translation? And also transparency in actually who did the translating. It was actually one guy, a, a guy named Brian Simmons, did the translation. And um, there's, there's a lot of question about actually his ability to even translate, um, that people that know him have said that he doesn't have the skills to actually translate. So, and even the website, if you go to the Passion Translation, it kind of hides the fact that he's the one that did it. Um, where something that somebody might compare it to, like the message, the message is very transparent in, in who they are and what they've done. If you look at the message translation of the Bible paraphrase, it has Eugene Peterson's name right on the cover. He's, 
Exactly. He says it's a reader's version of the Bible. I did this for my church. I'm sharing it with the world. Yeah. Right. And on the pa on the message website, they give you the names of the people that have looked over his shoulder and the passion doesn't do that. The message doesn't call itself a translation. It calls itself a paraphrase. Mm -hmm. the, the passion calls itself a translation when really it's not. It's a paraphrase. Um, so, yeah, I think if the question is asked, is it doing more harm than good? I think for some people, honestly, just to be candid, it's, it's not harming them. Honestly, they're reading it. And if they're reading it with other Bibles, you know, I, I, I guess I'll look the other way. I'm not going to make a soapbox and get on top of it. But I think it is doing harm in the sense that are we going into a place now where we're saying any group of people that wants the Bible to sound like they, the way they talk, let's make a Bible for that. And what I mean by that, it's one thing to make a translation for a group of people that don't have the Bible in their language, but the Passion Translation is really geared for um, like the real charismatic community, of which I have ties to. I'm Pentecostal charismatic, but there's language in the Passion or in the yeah the Passion Translation that you can tell is very geared for mm -hmm. the charismatic community. When it seems to me that a Bible ought to be geared for the English-speaking world at large, you know, not just a small group. Anyway. The African? I guess I don't. I don't know. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, it's all. All of them are translations from the original Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek, so, I mean, English is just as far away as some African languages, so, mm -hmm. not necessarily. Okay. So that's the thing. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. So I think what I, one thing I, Christian and I were talking about this, and then we'll close with this. I think I, I want I want my translators of a Bible to be students and very they're they're theologians and they're very good with language. That should be their gifting. I don't because the original Bible I believe was inspired of God. So I want translators to be good students to know what those words mean and how do they bring them into English. I don't necessarily want my translators to be receiving revelation about how to translate. And that's kind of how Brian Simmons talks. He, he's had visions of angels giving him certain translation. So I'm just thinking, eh, I think the original text, Greek and Hebrew, was inspired. So let's find out what that says. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Anyway, we should close. Let me just say one thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thing. <laughs> one thing. Simple. So what, do, you, do you guys know what the best translation to read is? There we go. It's the one that you're actually going to read. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, with the knowledge, with the growth idea that you want to grow in your understanding of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so, there are dynamic equivalencies. There's word-for-word -word translations, um, and they all have a place because uh, if you really want to talk about translating, I mean, if you know another language, you know how many ways you can change and present words. And so, there is the semantic domain that you have to operate in in order to accurately translate the word and the thought mm -hmm. the subject matter and so with that said um, the only thing I just wanted to add is that when you have there's there are individuals that have done translations that are considered very academic and they're well respected mm -hmm. because they have all their notes in the translations and they're used partly by other scholars as well mm -hmm. to and so Dr. Green is one of those Darby is one of those uh, there's a couple others I can't think of right now um, but those typically aren't used as like, oh, here's a translation to replace. Here's a translation to help you look how words were translated to help you in your studies mm -hmm. in greater research. And there's a big difference between that. And so um, there are, yeah, you do want to be careful mm -hmm. with your translations, though. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you want to be mindful um, because sometimes some words that are, you know, um, especially on how, like, the world translation or whatever the, uh, new, world the new world translation you know they specifically leave out deity phrases that are actually in greek you know and so uh, and that's the definite article you know so you have like they so they translate like in the god as like an a god you know and so meaning one of many gods and anyways and so and that's the jehovah's witness that's bible that's a jehovah's witness yeah. bible so yeah. anyways and it is so important
Well, we should wrap up. Uh, hopefully, this has just generated some more stuff to talk about. So if something sparked your interest and you want to chat more, mm -hmm. let's do that. But um, Dennis, would you mind closing us in prayer? Sure. Go ahead yeah. and grab the mic there. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, um, we thank you that you are our ultimate mentor. Mm -hmm. We thank you for putting older people, we just declare mentor on this on this group mm -hmm. we thank you for putting older people into all of our lives that have mentored us and that continue to mentor us and lord we ask that you would build we give you permission to build a, a culture of mentorship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in this body and so mm -hmm. we thank you for that we thank you for um being our mentor and shepherd and you know all that you are and so we thank you we thank you for this evening um, we just speak blessings over each one. And, Lord, we just pray a special blessing, too, over the, the one, whoever's going to be re listening to this recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We speak to you, and we speak special blessings upon you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we ask for breakthrough mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we thank you for safety. Keep us all safe. Put mm -hmm. angels around all our little cars. <laughs> <laughs> we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Awesome. Mm -hmm.